Smaller cartels. We got him, we got him. Hare 
tai No, before we start, um, today's the devotees' days. The devotees are going to the movies. We don't go to the movies, but today we go to the movies. Didn't you know that? Every year on August 11th, we go to the movies. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> The actual understanding is today is the debut in Chicago for Hare Krishna. Uh, the mantra and the man who, uh, the Swami who began it all. So it's two o'clock today. If there's any devotees that want to come, I think we got extra tickets. So that's at two o'clock. Uh, Mother Rishaka, are you be coming today? You're going to another program, huh? Some fest, okay. You've seen it already. <laughs> I think you've seen it more than anybody. <laughs> From the inside out. <laughs> okay, so anyone who wants to come, I think, uh, Subal, we have cars, we can, everyone's can go. Yeah. Yeah, we have one vehicle coming from the outside, and that's a van, but we might need more room, so if anyone wants to come, we have extra tickets, and we can go. Okay, so Srimad Bhagavatam. This is Canto 9, Chapter 9. The Dynasty of Amsuman, text number 30. Four all the way up to text forty two. This is that's the first purport. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Which one's on the board there? 41? 42? Yeah. Okay, so, hmm. How we do this? Okay. Yo deva artito daityam. Avayed yudi durjayaha Mahurtam ayujan dyatyaidya Swapuran sandade manaha Yo daivar artito datyan Avayed yudya durjayaha Muhurtam ayur gyat vaitya Swapuram sandade manaha Yodaivayar artito daityan Avayid Yudi Durjayaha 
Mohurtamayogyatvaityam Swapuram Sandhe Manaha for word, <laughs> Ya, King Kadvangya, King Kadvanga, who, Devai, by the demigods, Artita, being requested, Daityan, the demons, Avadit, killed, U.D., in a fight, Durjayaha, very fierce, Muhurtam, for a second only, Ayu, duration of life, Gyatva, knowing, Et Ya, approached, Swapuram, his own abode, Sandade, fixed manaha, the mind. So before we read the actual verse and purport, we go back to verse number 434 and read the verses that lead up to this verse, which are the last verses. So this is a whole different theme. that, will, And this one is about is King, King, Salda, King Saldasa, who was devoured a Brahmin. I, this, one, this is the most interesting pastime I've ever come across. And he's, he was cursed to become a, he, a cannibal. He was cursed to become a cannibal because he committed some offense. And his wife, is the Brahmin's wife is lamenting because King Saudasa is going to devour her husband. Mm. And so she's pleading with him not to, you know, make her husband Prashad. So, so here we go. So this is the next verse. For those of you who haven't followed along, it seems to just jump right at you. So... <clears throat> When the chaste wife of the Brahmin saw that her husband, who was about to discharge semen, had been eaten by the man-eater, she was overwhelmed with grief and lamentation, thus she angrily cursed the king. O foolish, sinful person, because you have eaten my husband when I was sexually inclined and desiring to have a seed of a child, I shall also see you die when you attempt to discharge semen in your wife. In other words, Whenever you attempt to sexually unite with your wife, you shall die. <laughs> Thus, the wife of the Brahmin cursed King Saudasa, known as Mitrasaha. Then, being inclined to go with her husband, she set fire to her husband's bones, 
fell into the fire herself and went with him to the same destination. Sex and violence. Huh? well in the Bhagavatam. <laughs> After twelve years, when King Saudasa was released from the curse by Vashishta, he wanted to have sexual intercourse with his wife, but the queen reminded him of the curse by the Brahmani, and thus he was checked from sexual intercourse. After being thus instructed, the king gave up the future happiness of sexual intercourse and by destiny remained sunless. Later, with the son's permission, the great saint Vasishtu begat a child in the womb of Madayanti. Next verse. Madayanti, <coughs> Madayanti bore the child within the womb for seven years and did not give birth. Therefore, Vashishta struck her abdomen with a stone, and then the child was born. Consequently, the child was known as Asmaka, the child born of a stone. Verse 40. From Asmaka, Balika took birth because Balika was surrounded by women and was therefore saved from the angle of Parasuram. He was known as Narikasvu. Narikavacha, one who is protected by women. When, Paras, when Parasar, Parasarama vanquished all the Kshatriyas, Balika became the progenitor of more Kshatriyas. Therefore, he was known as Mulaka, the root of the Kshatriya dynasty. See, Parasarama was, was out to kill all the kings in that time. But he would not kill a king if the king was getting married. So that's why King Dasarat had 350 wives, because he knew when he heard that Paras Saram was in the area, he would get married again. <laughs> so Paras Saram wouldn't kill him. That's interesting. King Dasarat, the father of Lord Ram. So, because Parasaram was very inclined to ladies, anyone who was protected by ladies would be spared of his life. Interesting. From Balika came a son named Dasarat. From Dasarat came a son named Aidavidi. And from Aidavidi came King Vishvasaha. The son of King Vishvasaha was the famous Maharaj Kadvanga. So today's verse. King Katvanga was unconquerable in any fight, requested by the demigods to join them in fighting the demons. He won victory for the demigods and being very pleased, wanted to give him a benediction. The king inquired from them about the duration of his life and was informed that he had only one moment more. Thus he immediately left the palace and went to his own residence. He engaged his mind fully at the lotus feet of the Lord. This is an amazing story. Purport. The example of King Kadvanga in performing devotional service is brilliant. Prabhupada says, the first line. The example of King Kadvanga in performing devotional service is brilliant. Maharaj Kadvanga engaged himself for only a moment in the devotional service of the Lord. But he was promoted back to Godhead. Therefore, if one practiced the devotional service from the beginning of his life, surely he would return home back to Godhead without a doubt. Asam Sayam. In Bhagavad Gita, the word Asam Saya is used to describe the devotee. Therefore, the Lord Himself gives the instructions. Maya Shaktam Manu Partaha Yoyam Yunjan Marasrayaham Asam sayam samagram mam tatsrinu. Now hear, O son of Prithar Arjun, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. That's verse number 7 1 in Bhagavad Gita. Just a side note, Srila Prabhupada spoke on many verses in both Bhagavad Gita and in Srimad Bhagavatam. But if you do a little research, you'll find that this verse, 7-1, Prabhupada spoke on the most, more than any verse, multiplied two or three times. In other words, 
He spoke on this verse at least three times more than he spoke on any other verse. 7.1 from Bhagavad Gita. And I'll read it again. Krishna is speaking. He says, now hear, O son of Pritha, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. That's the whole process. By performing bhakti yoga with full consciousness of Krishna, and that mind becomes fixed on Krishna, you can know Krishna without a doubt. That's the essence of the philosophy. The Lord also instructs, Jan makarma chime divyam evam yo veti tattvataha taktva deham purna janma naiti mameti surjuna. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, or Arjuna. That's from Bhagavad Gita 4.9. When Prabhupada was asked, what is the most important verse in Bhagavad Gita? He said this one, 4, 9. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in the material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. So what does that mean? One who knows Krishna and the secrets the, the spiritual, mysterious secrets of his appearance and his activities, when that person leaves the body, they go back to Godhead automatically. Therefore, from the beginning of one's life, one should practice bhakti yoga, which increases one's attachment for Krishna. If one daily sees the deity in a temple, makes offering by worshiping the deity, chants the holy name of the personality of Godhead, and preaches about the glorious activities of the Lord as much as possible, that person thus becomes attached to Krishna. This attachment is called ashakti. When one's mind is attached to Krishna, maya shakti mana, one can fulfill the mission of life in one's human birth. If one misses this opportunity, one does not know where one is going, how long he will remain in the cycle of birth and death, when he will again achieve the human form of life and have a chance to go back home, back to Godhead. The most intelligent person, therefore, uses every moment of one's life to render loving service to the Lord. This is the secret of success. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gina Jala Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Maha Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare the example of Mahakatvanga is quite nice. Prabhupada talks about this in some of his lectures, where he mentions that one moment of perfection is enough to achieve, to, to return home back to Godhead. What was Maharaj Katvanga's qualification? He was fortunate. You could say he was fortunate. What was that fortune? He was a powerful king on the earth planet, and he was asked by the demigods to assist them in their fight against the demons in the heavenly planets. He left his kingdom and everything else behind just to assist the demigods. And then because of the fighting of Maharaj Kadvanga and his armies, the demigods were victorious. In other words, it was, he made the difference between defeat or uh, victory with the demigods. And because of that, the demigods were so pleased. And they said, Maharaj, take any benediction you want. Whatever you want, just ask. And he said, please let me know how long I have to live. I want to know what is my duration of life. They said, Maharaj, you have one moment left. <laughs> and 
When he heard that, he immediately, with full consciousness, fixed his mind on the lotus feet of the Lord, and then at that point, he went back to Godhead. So here's the perfection. So you might say, well, sounds pretty good. I'll just wait for that last moment to become Krishna conscious. In the meantime, I'll do other things. <laughs> no. It's, Maharaj Kanvanga didn't have any preconceived con idea that he was going to leave the body, nor did he plan to, to act in that way when he did. It was a circumstance that was perfect. So if one thinks, I'll just, you know, I'll just enjoy material life, and then when I get down to the end, I'll just put my mind on the lotus feet of the Lord, and perfection is guaranteed. No, Krishna won't let you think of him. <laughs> he won't. Because he knows your mentality, and it's not one of devotion. It's one of trying to take advantage of the situation. So sometimes in Bengal, they say, yeah, we worship Durga in our whole life, and when we die, we think of Krishna. <laughs> right? This is the Beng This is very common in Bengal. Worship Durga, and then just plan on worshiping Krishna when the time comes. One cannot do that. One cannot cheat the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, but, but, but this point is very important to understand here, and what is that point? That by absorbing one's consciousness on the lotus feet of the Lord, why lotus feet? What's so special about the lotus feet of the Lord? Just like when we take darshan of the deity, we look, we place our gaze at the lotus feet of the Lord, and then we move our eyes up the body of the Lord to the smiling face of the Lord, and then back down to the lotus feet, and then we offer our obeisances. So the lotus feet indicate pure devotional service. They also indicate surrender. So these two principles, when we absorb ourselves in the lotus feet of the Lord, it means I'm surrendering to the Lord and I am engaging in his service. So that's the indication of the Lord's lotus feet. And of course, another reason is that when you approach a great personality, you always approach to the feet. He always approach to the feet, because that is a sign of humility. That is a sign of respect. So in the same way, the success of one's approach to the, Lord, to the Lord is through the lotus feet. I did a little research in Bhagavatam. It's an ongoing research. I just, when I read Bhagavatam, any verse that I come across that mentions the Lord's lotus feet, I take that verse and put it aside into a file. So I've been collecting as many verses as I can on the Lord's lotus feet. And be surprised how many times the actual translations of the verses actually meant mention Krishna's lotus feet as being the success of one's uh, meditation like that. We can just examine Krishna's lotus feet. What is on the bottom of Krishna's lotus feet? There are 32 symbols divided into, I think it's 19 on one and 13 on the other. That would make 32, right? And each of the symbols have a different meaning, either for the Lord's own ornamentation, his qualities, or something in relationship to the Lord. I mean, I'm sorry, something in relationship to the devotee. So, what are those things that are in relationship to the devotee? One of the things is a thunderbolt on the lotus feet of the Lord. And Lord Shiva makes a beautiful prayer describing the beauty of the lotus feet of the Lord, comparing, it, comparing that thunderbolt, comparing our sins to a mountain that the living entity do the association with the material energy for life after life at Mitchimaya Vese Kachuhabu Bububai 
Jeev Krishna Das, hey Vishwas, Kali Tara Dukanai, so many lives, we cannot count how many lives we have been in the material world. Kardanam Gunasango Syo Sarasajonis, from the highest planet to the, in the material world down to the lowest, the living entity is transmigrating one body after another, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes in the middle, sometimes in other species. Actually, it's tr it actually starts with lower species and evolves ultimately to the human forms. So, the understanding of the association of maya, or material energy, is so strong that the living entity in the material world has a title called Nityabada. Now, this is an interesting statement because it doesn't really define the actual situation. What does that mean? Nitya means eternal and Bada means conditioned. So we understand that the living entity is a pure soul and at one point in our existence we were with Krishna in the spiritual world. But now we have come to the material world and that material sojourn, it's called a sojourn, is called Nitya Bada. What does that mean? That means that although we are with Krishna, somehow we have been eternally associating with the material energy. How is that possible? It's not. But what is the, what is the actual meaning is, is that our association with maya is so long-termed that no one can trace out its, its source. How many lives? And Prabhupada says millions of lives. Millions of lives and different species of life. Sometimes it says one transmigrates from all, all the lower species, eight million species, and finally comes to the human form of life after being in eight million species. That's not for all souls, but some souls do that. Others may miss a few species here and there. <laughs> Krishna is so kind, Krishna is so kind that he actually appears in his form as Krishna in every species of life. Did you know that? He, he can be the nicest cockroach. <laughs> we don't think of Krishna as in the, in the cockroach incarnation of the Lord, <laughs> but it's there. Prabhupada says, and why does the Lord appear in these lower forms? Because that particular species gets attracted to that particular member of their own species, which is Krishna, and by that attraction, they are elevated faster on the chain of what we say transmigration. So this is how kind Krishna is. He actually wants to elevate the lower species faster to the human forms so they can have a chance for devotional service. That's Krishna. Very merciful. So this lotus feet and our association with the Lord and the thunderbolt, that means due to that association we have developed this mindset and accumulated so many, many, many what we say, material desires, material attachments, material activities, material tendencies. Bhaktivinoda Thakur is a spiritual scientist, but he's also a spiritual psychologist. And in his psychology, he, he explains how material desires manifest in different aspects of themselves. What are the, what are the nature of how material desires manifest? And some of them are just bad habits. <laughs> habits that we have developed. We're habituated to the material tendencies like that. So to get free from that is very, very hard. But Krishna's lotus feet carry that thunderbolt and mountain of sin now, a mountain can only be destroyed by a thunderbolt. 
So when Indra throws his thunderbolt, a mountain becomes demolished. <laughs> so the, the thunderbolt at the Lord's lotus feet is powerful enough to destroy mountains and mountains of sinful activities that has been accumulated in our association with the material energy. So by focusing your mind on the lotus feet of the Lord, you get that thunderbolt also. <laughs> it's there. The lotus feet of the Lord is very purifying. And Prabhupada says something very interesting. He says, you will never be impeded in your execution of devotional service if you remember the lotus feet of the Lord. Sometimes we think, can I do this service? Will I have difficulties, obstacles, setbacks, reverses? But Prabhupada says, if you remember Krishna's lotus feet, any service that you're performing will become free from all obstacles. In other words, you'll be fixed in the service like that. So that's how powerful Krishna's lotus feet are. So his lotus feet, along with the holy name, are practically synonymous in the purification process. So there's those who meditate on the lotus feet of the Lord, and there's those who chant Hare Krishna. And there's those who do both. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> we do both. So we should also understand how powerful. And we have the example of Maharaj Katvanga. Simply by thinking of Krishna's lotus feet for a moment, a moment means a second. <laughs> There's that verse. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastri, who I love a matta. Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi, who I love a matta means one eleventh of a second. So if you could divide a second into eleven parts, that's a love a matta. And a lava mata is enough to become purified. <laughs> That's how powerful this process is. So by focusing on, and we have the beautiful form of Sri Sri Kishore Kishore, we just have to place our gaze at the lotus feet of the Lord in a very, one, in a very reverential way, and then remember Krishna's lotus feet. And then there's so many wonderful things happen to the devotee simply by remembering Krishna's lotus feet. The devotee becomes happy, the devotee becomes free from any possibility of being attacked by the material energy. So, so this process is very powerful. <clears throat> so another thing, you'll see Krishna's lotus feet is red on the bottom. <clears throat> Why is that? He was out bathing in the beach, and so his feet were up in the air, and he got sunburned, right? That was it? No. <laughs> well, actually, that's pretty close. <laughs> it says that there is the effulgence of the sun has a red color to it, and that effulgence is manifested by a personality called Aruni. A-R-U-N-I. So that the reflection of Krishna's red, reddish lotus feet is the reflection of the sun where Aruni wants to take shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. So that's one of the reasons why Krishna's lotus feet. Would you like to hear the other one? Okay. Everybody looks like they're asleep or waiting for the class to get over. Am I putting everybody to sleep here? I guess I'm half tired myself, maybe that's why. They say if the speaker's tired, everybody else goes to sleep too. <laughs> so if you can do me a favor, just keep me awake by kind of nodding once in a while and you can even throw something if you want. <laughs> but I, you know, you all look like you're totally bored. <laughs> She's the only one that's listening to me. Everybody looks like they're bored. <laughs> He's watching his phone. You're thinking, you're looking at me like once prashadam. <laughs> Mother Vishaka is in meditation. 
So we have different experiences. So when you give class, you kind of notice the audience really easy, and you're thinking, hmm, do they really want to hear this? <laughs> I guess you do. Anyway, keep me awake. So the other point, and this is wonderful, is that the Krishna's lotus feet are the reflective love of Radharani's glance. Mm -hmm. So when Radharani looks at Krishna, she also takes her gaze upon his lotus feet. And that gaze is so full of love that it causes Krishna's feet to turn red. Wow. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice. So these are the two reasons mentioned in the Shastras that Krishna has the reddish color there. So those, those lotus feet are so wonderful. You can spend all day just talking about Krishna's lotus feet. Each of the symbols represent a particular characteristic and quality of Krishna's feet. There's one book written by devotees, or, or actually compiled by devotees, where they take the the descriptions of Krishna's lotus feet along with all the markings and describe each of the markings and the positions of the markings like that. So we pray to the Lord to put his lotus feet on our heads and we can do that. There's two ways you can actually put Krishna's lotus feet in your, on your head. One is that when you go up to the altar the pujari gives you that thing that's Krishna's lotus feet. And the other way is simply to think about Krishna's lotus feet. Because the mind, in, the mind is, thinks through the brain, and the brain is in the head. So when you think in that area, you got, your mind is kind of connected with Krishna's lotus feet. So that means his feet is on your head. Nice. <laughs> That's nice. So keeping Krishna's lotus feet on the head means success in devotional service. So Maharaj Katvanga is the epitome of success. Here, he went immediately back home, back to Godhead. And Prabhupada makes this point that <clears throat> one who remembers Krishna, and he's actually quoting Krishna, Krishna, and Krishna is known as he is. And Prabhupada says, Therefore, this is the most important um, one who uses their life every moment to think of Krishna and to engage in devotional service to the Lord is the most intelligent. That means it's called sumedasa. There's a term medasa. Medasa means intelligence. Su means great. There's another term called alpa medasa. Alpa means meager or small. One whose intelligence is never very small does not understand or see the benefit of thinking of Krishna engaging in devotional service. That's why Lord Chaitanya, one verse describing the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, Krishna Varna Tvasa Krishna Sangopanga Saparshadam Yagnai Sankirtana Prayai Yajanti Hi Sumedasaha The last word in the means that one who is actually intelligent understands that to glorify the Lord by chanting the holy names of the Lord is the topmost form of devotional expression and that leads one to perfection. <laughs> so here's the perfectional stage. So we can learn from Kad Maharaj Kadvanga. Just think of Krishna's lotus feet. But that's not so easy. Now we have so many things to do and we're also planning for things in the future. So our minds are engaged in different ways. Is it possible to always remember Krishna's lotus feet even while you're doing so many things? If you practice, if you practice. And one of the ways that will help you with the practice is every day come in the morning and see Krishna's lotus feet. Place your gaze at the lotus feet of the Lord for a long time and take a mental snapshot. <laughs> and keep that mental snapshot throughout the day. And then when it becomes strong enough, 
becomes easy to remember Krishna's lotus feet more and more and more like that. And that's success. Okay, I'm not going to speak so long today. Any questions or comments on Krishna's lotus feet, the perfection of devotional service, Maharaj Kadvanga's good fortune? Yes. Maharaj, I, I think you, I just missed the last part that you said, and I think it was, I was thinking of this question, and I think you addressed the question a little bit, so forgive me if I, you know, miss that part, I got distracted a little bit. Um, but when you mentioned that one, by remembering the Lotus, one was performing devotional service and remembers the Lotus feet of the Lord, then that uh, becomes a means to actually be successful in your devotional service. That's Prabhupada's direct statement. Yes. And obviously I'm thinking, well, um, oh, wonderful. I have, there's so many different challenging services that are coming, you know, throughout this month. And I'm thinking, oh, this is it. I'm going to be remembering Lord, the Lord's feet of Kishore Kishori and then it not necessarily works like that. I said, no, 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 no. It cannot be that simple. Oh, There's yeah. more to it. No, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> just do it like that? Yeah, you just remember Krishna's lotus feet. You're, you have achieved perfection, <laughs> both in devotion and in the execution of your services. Everything is it's perfect. Yeah, it's, it's the greatest treasure, Krishna's lotus feet. The uh, story in, what is that scripture? Um, by Lochandas Thakur, Chaitanya Mangala. Chaitanya Mangala describes <clears throat> how Lord, Ch not Lord Chaitanya, Lord Krishna is traveling. He finally comes to Dwarka. And when he comes to Dwarka, he's greeted by his most prominent and most qualified queen, Queen Rukmini. She immediately wants to offer service. So she grabs Krishna's lotus feet and she starts massaging her, his feet. While she's massaging her feet, his feet, she becomes overwhelmed with emotion and starts crying with, out of great happiness and out of great love. And as she's crying, she starts to express herself in words. And she starts to say, my dear Lord, your lotus feet are so wonderful. So wonderful. So wonderful. Actually, you don't even know how wonderful your lotus feet are. She also says that. Your lotus feet are so wonderful that even you don't know the wonder of your own lotus feet. And then she goes on to say, there's only one person in all of existence knows how wonderful your lotus feet. So Krishna gets curious. Who is that? And then she reveals Srimati Radharani. So Lodjan Thakur makes this statement that Krishna now thinks, I want to find out how wonderful my lotus feet are. But I can't do it from my position, I have to do it from her position. So then he takes the form of Lord Chaitanya. And why? To understand how wonderful he is. What is her love for, her, for him? What is the nature of her love? and the happiness she experiences in that love. So these are the three internal reasons why the Lord appeared as Lord Chaitanya. Mm -hmm. And so that was inspired by this pastime with Krishna. Rukmini says, you don't know how wonderful your lotus feet are. Mm -hmm. so. so I can't describe him. I don't have the power 
I'm not a, I'm just a conditioned soul. I can't describe the wonders of Krishna's lotus feet. But we can understand that we take the, the statements of Srila Prabhupada, if you remember Krishna's lotus feet, you will never be impeded, impeded in any form in your expression of devotional service. So I was just thinking of a little gimmick, I guess that's the word. You can just take a pair of glasses and just put Krishna's lotus feet on the inside and wear those glasses all day. <laughs> and you won't see much, but you'll see everything at the same time. <laughs> so Krishna's lotus feet will be constantly impressed upon your vision. When Kaliya was, you know, purified by Krishna, Kaliya was afraid to leave because he knew that Garuda would kill him if he went anywhere except being in Vrindavan. But Krishna says, you can't stay in Vrindavan. But he said, my dear Lord, you know, if I go, I'll, you know, Kaliya will destroy me. Krishna said, no, he will see the imprints of my lotus feet on your head and he will not do anything. And then Kaliya left. <clears throat> well, Kaliya is still living today. Prabhupada said he lives in the island of Fiji and he lives in a cave. And even the, the islanders say there's a cave that no one goes in. And they all have this idea that there's a snake inside this cave. Prabhupada said that, that Kaliya lives on the island of Fiji. You've heard that in Mother Vishaka? Yeah, see. Yeah. So, yeah, so if you get Krishna's lotus feet on your head, either through thought or somehow he kicks you and somehow the imprint stays there, then your life is perfect. <laughs> So we can do that. We can just pray to have Krishna's lotus feet in our minds all the time. So, chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and uh, thinking about Krishna's lotus feet, both of them are the perfection of, of meditation, either one. We find it easier and more natural to chant Hare Krishna, and that's the Yuga Dharma. But if you you read the scriptures, you'll find so many statements about the beauty and the auspiciousness and the power of remembering Krishna's lotus feet. There are so many statements. So, any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, when we are doing a service, in the beginning of the service there is a meditation that Krishna, this is for your pleasure. But when the service is begun, then the, the thoughts are more in the service than to see that this is for Krishna's pleasure. Is it something that can be improved upon or is it... Well, there's a dialogue between Narada Muni and Krishna's father, Vasudev. It's in the 11th canto, <clears throat> where <clears throat> Vas Narada Muni is, is talking about Krishna to his father, Vasudev. Because Vasudev knows Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because he had to take Vasudev out of the prison and bring him to Nanda Maharaj in Vrindavan. So, in this dialogue, which happens because Krishna now, he leaves Mathura and goes back to Vrindavan after, being, after killing Kamsa. The residents of Mathura don't want Krishna to leave. <clears throat> they killed Kamsa and they're doing everything to keep Krishna and Balaram there. But Nanda Maharaj comes, he's already there, and he wants to take Krishna back to Vrindavan. Mother Yasoda is practically on the verge of death because Krishna is gone along with all the residents of Vrindavan. So Krishna and Balaram are there, and they want to go back, 
But the residents of Mathura are not letting Krishna go back. <laughs> They're not. And they use different excuses, just like King Ugrasena, who's now the king, after he's been reinstalled by Krishna after killing Kamsa. He says, Krishna, if you go, our enemies will come and attack us. But with your presence here, we will be safe from our enemies. So therefore, you should protect us. So Krishna and Balaram every night are talking. This is mentioned in Garga Samhita. It's also mentioned in other places. How to get back to Vrindavan. But at the same time, the love of the Mathura Basis is so strong that they can't leave. So Vasudev, he's talking to Narada Muni. And he was saying that, you know, Krishna is my son. But, and I've, in, 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 in trying to serve him in different ways, I didn't remember him. Because I was so much absorbed in serving him. And Narada Muni says, Vasudev, there's no difference. <laughs> He basically, what we say, consoles him from his anxiety and say, because you remembered Krishna, you were with Krishna. <laughs> because, I mean, because you were serving Krishna, you were with Krishna. And Prabhupada would say that all the time. The devotional service to the Lord is non-different than the Lord himself. So what does that mean? There's three aspects of our existence. We have our body, we have our mind, and we have our words. So when those three things are engaged simultaneously in devotional service, then you are fixed. If you're doing something, but your mind is not there, you're not fully engaged in devotional service. So you have to bring your mind into the activity along with whatever words are being spoken have to be, has to be connected to the activity also. Can't talk nonsense and then do devotional service at the same time. <laughs> so body, mind, and words are absorption. And when you're doing that, you are, are not, it's non-different than Krishna. And you can experience the happiness when one is fully absorbed in one service. Yeah. We have to practice that. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. All right, so we're getting on. So today we're going to the movies. It was what well, Mother Vishaka was telling me one little movie innuendo story. The story is, no, you want to tell it or I, should I tell it? You tell it better. Tell about uh, Madhava's wife. Madhava. Uh. Madhava, the Kirtaniya, his wife Radhika got a big um, container of popcorn before seeing the film with the intention of honoring the popcorn during the film. And at the end of the film, the entire container was completely full. She was so absorbed in the film that she forgot to eat her popcorn. When one is absorbed in Krishna consciousness, then one forgets about their popcorn. <laughs> and all the other pops that come with, the, with it. <laughs> There's many pops sometimes. <laughs> if you don't know Sanskrit, you didn't get that joke. So anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai Krishna's lotus feet ki jai Srila Prabhupada ki jai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Haribo